Hey everybody, welcome back to our newest installment of Sunday School via the internet. So uh, I'm using a program called Screencastify, and I don't know if, if any of you all are familiar at all with any of these programs. I know Zoom has become really familiar and uh, Teams and things of that nature, but this one is Screencastify, and um, I was paying for it whenever I was teaching and having to teach from home, and this is one that uh, I was able to just call the company and say, hey, I no longer have that email address, so anyway, I could switch over, and they've allowed me to do that, so I really appreciate them them doing that for me. I paid for it, but it's still nice. They were really helpful, so uh, I'm going to step back. I was I have to step up here in order to start the thing, so I want to step back. Guys, I hope everybody's had a great week. I hope everybody has, um, you know, regardless of whether it's been a great week, that you recognize uh, God in all of it, so, you know, uh, one of the things that God promises us is joy. Not not always happiness, but He promises joy, even in the midst of turmoil and strife. And uh, I hope you all have been able to experience that this week. Um, I, I have. It's been it's been a good week, and uh, it's been a tiring week, but uh, it's kind of been nice. Uh, it's, it's, a lot of my colleagues, former colleagues, and my friends have gone back to school, and they've been sitting in professional development, and Pam and I haven't. So that's kind of been a, a nice twist for us. But, you know, God is good, and, and I've had several conversations with people this week, and uh, it's just been an uplifting week in, in so many different ways. Pam and I are still doing a lot of canning, and I think we're done. I think we have to be because we're out of jars and lids and, and all that other stuff. So uh, I'm kind of glad that's over, too. But it's, it'll be fun this winter when we can take out jars and, and eat you know, fresh food and from, from our garden. So we're excited about that as well. Um Guys, just a couple of things before we get started in today's lesson. Again, please continue to pray, and I've shared this over and over again, but I've just been so amazed by how active God has been when I've slowed down enough to pay attention, and I've taken the time to, to pray like God wants me to pray, pray without ceasing. And it seems like we have done more and more of that, uh, Pam and I have, uh, during this um, shutdown, if you will. So, and, and it's just been amazing watching God at work. And Guys, for those of you I have not seen since uh, we've gone to this new format, man, I miss you guys, and I can't wait till we can get together again. And uh, for those of you who are wondering when we can, if you feel comfortable enough, we'll be meeting Sunday in uh, the, the gymnasium, and we've got set up for however many people want to be there. I've got a mic, so you can be as far away from other people as you feel comfortable being indoors. I'm not trying to put pressure on anybody, but... Uh, we would absolutely love to see you. There's just a different dynamic of that. And it's not the same thing as a small Sunday school class that's really intimate, but it's still, it's, it's so much more intimate than this. So um, just keep that in mind. I'm going to go ahead and open this with a word of prayer. Pray with me. And again, pause as you go through this. Take as much time as you want or as little time as you want. Some of you may even have programs that can speed through some of this stuff. So, uh, but I would encourage you to uh, use this time as, as worship. So. Let's, let's pray together. Father God, we're so grateful to you for this day. I'm grateful to you for this cool weather, Father, and just for um, the bountiful harvest that you have provided us with. And Father, just for the joy that you give us in our lives. Father, I thank you so much for your son, Jesus, that all of this is a gift through him, that without him, Father, we can't experience all of these joyous things that you provide in our lives. Lord God, we want to lift up each of the prayer requests. We pray that you would be with Mike and and his mom, Father God, we pray that you would be with him and his mom. Uh, Lord God, we pray that you continue to be with Sammy and Georgiana and uh, Father with Tracy McClellan and with uh, those who've lost loved ones, with my buddy David. And, uh, Father God, there's, there's so much hurt in this world, and we know because it's, it's sin. But Father God, we know that you have provided us a way to eternal salvation through your Son, Jesus Christ. And Father, we just pray that you would help us to be doers of your word, that we would get out and we would share Jesus with others, that, that they might come to know you and that they might be grafted and adopted into your family. Lord God, we praise you. We thank you. We pray that as we go through today's lesson, that you would lead us and guide us. Again, Father, not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, that we might spread your joy to those who are around us. Father, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so I'd ask the question, can you hear me on this, to, to some people at church last Sunday. And I said, oh, yeah, we can hear just fine. By the way, this shirt 
It's Logan's shirt left in his room. This is not a Tennessee shirt. It is orange, but not all things orange are Tennessee. So, just wanted to clarify that. There needed to be some sort of clarification. So, uh, the title of today's lesson is Relational Foundation. It comes from Song of Songs. And I shared with some of you earlier that I was a little nervous. Uh, I looked at Proverbs. Hey, Proverbs, Song of Songs. Whoa, Song of Songs, because I've read through Song of Songs. Uh, this is not my first uh, my first time through Song of Songs. And I looked at it, and I was like, oh, no, this is going to be kind of touchy. So uh, just bear with me. And, and again, even though this is a, a poem written by Solomon, uh, and he's, he takes three different people's voices as he writes this poem. He writes as uh, a woman. He writes as the man. And then I, I forget, there's a third Maybe there's just two, but I was thinking there was a third uh, person whose side he was taking in this, but it may just be, and, and for, for this week, it's just him and her. So uh, it comes from chapter 2, verses 15 through chapter 3, verse 5, okay? So God created humans to be relational, with the greatest relationship being between him and his people. That's, that's the single most important relationship is between God and his people. So, many of you are getting used to this because this is kind of the way I do things. So, as an introduction, so the author of this lesson in my quarterly, Explore the Bible, and my quarterly is a little bit different. It's, it's the teacher's edition, but uh, I, I don't know if the uh, first thoughts is the same in mine as it is in yours. But here's what the author did. He said, children are told that God made their hands for certain things, all right? So he describes teaching children about how we are made and why we are made. So he describes that our hands are not for hitting, uh, that, that our hands are for uh, uh, holding crayons and things of that nature, that our, our teeth aren't for biting, but uh, uh, they're for eating and, and chewing, and that uh, our feet are for running and not for kicking, that sort of thing. So that's, that's how he's describing that. Uh, and then he asks this question. How would you describe to a child God's purposes for making people? And I thought that was an interesting question because obviously we teach children different than we teach adults. But there are some things that don't change. We always share biblical truths. Right? We don't lie to a child in order to get them to understand the concept. We might have to teach them in a different way to give them a different uh understanding because they have different understandings. They have different experiences. There are things they don't understand. Much of what we read in the Bible is taken from an agricultural experience because everybody understood that in an agricultural age. Uh, so, so the first thing that I would hope that everybody understands is that God made us to glorify Him. So He made us in His image. you got to understand, God created the heavens and the earth. God created the animals. God created the oceans. God created the stars in the heaven. He created everything. And then he created man, his crowning achievement. That's, that's the way he looks at us. We are his crowning achievement. He knitted us in our mother's womb. So we must understand and teach that we are special in God's eyes. But our purpose is to live for him. It's not for us. It's not for other people. Our purpose is is to live for him. So when we get into the single most important relationship, God made us to be relational, and the single most important relationship is the one that we have with God, the one who made us in his image. So how many of you either read to your children, uh, read to your children, or be, or you remember being read to as a child? Right? And I'll bet all of us can either uh, remember reading to our kids, whether it be from Bible, children's books, uh, you know, several books came flooding back to my mind as I was thinking about this. But uh, why do we do that? Why do we read to our children? Well, for me, it wasn't an option because Pam was a reading specialist, you know, kindergarten, first grade teacher. So while our children were still in the womb, we were reading to our children. I mean, that's that's what we did. My Pam would sit and she would in a rocking chair and she would read to our children when they were still in the womb. And she loved to do it. She wanted them to read 
and she wanted them to love to read. So what good is God's word? God has given us his word. What good is it if we can't read it? We have to be able to read that. You know, and I, as a former history teacher, I think back to, you know, abuses that have been uh, uh, carried out through the years. And one of the things they did in Europe is that, that priests would, uh, they would lie about, you know, what God's word said. And the people couldn't call them on it during the dark ages because they couldn't read. It. But our children developed a love for reading and being read too. They, they, you know, you never really get tired of that, I think. I think people enjoy being read to. It's, it's interesting. But one of the books that, that I think about whenever I think about reading to children, and, and you see it there, and I've got it here. I dug this out of uh, a room where Pam still keeps a lot of books. Uh, I love reading this to our children. Now, you know, they like a ton of different books. Man, I, I would have read this to them every single night. I absolutely love the book. And the basic premise of it is there's a little puppet. And it's it's a community full of puppets. And they're called Wemmicks, made out of wood. And uh, they all look different. They all have different talents and so forth. And what they do is these Wemmicks go around giving stars to these Wemmicks who are great singers or they have a pretty dress on or they like their shoes or they can jump high and they get a star for that. But if you're kind of not very special, if you're just kind of ordinary, they'll give you a dot. Well, Punchinello is, uh, uh, he's not very special. And, and that's just kind of the way this, this uh, whole book goes, is that he gets all kinds of dots. Well, he shows up one day to Eli, his maker, and uh, he says to him, I just think this is interesting. He shows up with all these dots. And Eli looks at him and says, looks like you've been given some bad marks. He said, I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. I don't care what the other women think. You don't? No, and you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They're women just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you're pretty special. And it goes on, and I'm not going to read the whole book to you, but, uh, man, what a great perspective. Our maker thinks that we're special. Why? He made us just the way we are. And what does he want from us? He wants a relationship. And what's that relationship supposed to look like? It's supposed to be us submitting to him. That's why he made us. Let's glorify him. And we'll talk more about that later. But we are relational cre creations of God. And we have to value relationships as well. That we absolutely have to. Not just first and foremost with him, but also those relationships around us. So let's go ahead and start in the Song of Songs. And we'll start with just verse 15. It's a standalone verse. And it reads, Catch the foxes for us. And this is coming from the woman's perspective. Solomon wrote the poem, but it's coming from the woman's perspective. And she says, Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that ruin the vineyards. For our vineyards are in bloom. So... I know we're not an agrarian society today, but we don't grow corn anymore because the raccoons eat it, okay? And I can't find a way to protect it. So this is a very similar verse to that. Solomon is writing a poem about his love for a future wife. So what is the meaning here of verse 15? What is it he is trying to say in verse 15? And what he's saying is that relationships need protecting from those who wish to do harm. So... To a garden, it's animals. Okay? Animals wish to do harm. Uh, and I don't know that they wish to do harm, but they do harm. They, they tear stuff up. So what or who are the predators that try to destroy godly relationships? Now, as we read through the scripture today, this is a relationship between Solomon, who deeply loves this woman, and this woman who deeply loves Solomon, and they're about to get married. And they are passionate towards one another. And you may say, well... This is about a marriage relationship. And yes, the poem is very much like that. But it's not just about that. I mean, it, it's about our relationship with God. It's about our relationship with our brothers and sisters in Christ. It's about any important relationship that we can glean a lot of information from that. So who are the predators that want to destroy these relationships? Well, my gosh, you know, the, the list is long. Satan is one. Satan hates the idea of godly people being in a positive, 
uplifting relationship with one another, enjoying each other's company. Other people do that. Work can do that, guys. I mean, we, we can we can work so hard that we fail to grow relationships that need to be grown. Television. And just and that's just a case of just sitting around. I don't want to do anything else. Any kind of distraction that interferes with growing and maintaining a healthy relationship is the fox described. It's going to ruin a relationship. So how do we protect our relationships from these predators? How, how do we do that? Well, number one, we have to prioritize. We have to recognize that this is a relationship that is worth growing. This is a relationship that is worth putting time into. And we use preventative care, just like with our personal health. There's a reason that we do things. There's a reason that you take your medicine. There's a reason that you um, exercise. There's a reason that you eat healthier foods. There's a reason. For all of these things, it's preventative care. We do the same thing, guys. We should do the same thing with our relationships. They require attention so that predators don't sneak in and destroy before we know what happens. Okay, This is true between husband and wife parents and children, friends and family, you have to spend time together. You have to. Otherwise, you don't really have a relationship. There has to be time spent together. Uh, and, and that could be through, you know, uh, mediums like what we're having to do right now. It could be, you know, our daughter lives in uh, in Atlanta, Haley, and she FaceTimes us quite a bit. And, uh, you know, I'm not used to that. That's a little different for me. But we get to see each other, and I get to see her cat, and she gets to see what's going on. Hey, look, we're, we're doing this right now, and um, we're sharing our lives with one another that way. Guys, we've got to do the same thing with God. We have to prioritize, and we have to make time for Him, and we have to share our lives with Him. That's what He wants. He made us for that purpose. We're, we're His greatest creation. He gave a son to die for us. He wants to spend time with us. He wants us to spend time with him. He is always ready to spend time with us. He will make the time to spend with him. And then part of that includes building trust. And we get into verses 16 and 17. Again, chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. And then, again, the woman's perspective. And she says, My love is mine, and I am his. He feeds among the lilies. Until the day breaks and the shadows flee, Turn around, my love, and be like a gazelle or a young stag on the divided mountains. So, I was never very good at poetry. Um, I don't know that I could quite write like this. Right? Sol Solomon did. Uh, obviously, Solomon did. But guess how many of you write poetry like this to your love? And some of you ladies may be like, he's never done. Uh, I don't think I've ever done that either. However, uh, this is something, this is a way of expressing his love for her, but also it's a teaching moment. Okay, So explain verse 16a. What is the picture being painted here? My love is mine and I am his. Because I, the way I read this, this is, this is passionate emotion, love. Uh, this is one of those things where she desires to be near him. She wants to be around him, and he wants to be around her. Once they are married, they become one. Because this is something the Bible has been so consistent about. And, and I don't mean to, uh, when I say that, I, I don't mean to come across as saying that it's not consistent in other ways. It is. But it just it kind of just floored me as I was going through this that, Time after time after time, we read about this idea of this plan of God's for a man and a woman to join together in holy matrimony. Everything we read about marriage from Genesis 2, 24, that, you know, a son will leave his mother and his father and he'll cleave to his wife. It's about commitment, guys, and it's about trust and becoming one. When you trust, then things like Ephesians 5, verses 22 through 33, don't upset you. It's the opposite of that. This is a beautiful picture. It's a beautiful picture of a godly Christian marriage. And, guys, it's not always easy. No relationship is always easy. That's why you have to protect it. 
And that's why you have to build trust. Trust, to me, is the single most important part of that relationship. So, as in most poetry, there's both literal and figurative language. How's Solomon being described by his bride here? A gazelle or a stag? So, one of the reasons I don't write poetry, uh, love poems, is I'm not good at it. And I'm not very good at expressing myself in those particular manners. But I just don't think, you know, as I read through here, there are times... Uh, in Song of Songs, where, you know, Solomon, that she would remind him of, of a mare. And I'm saying, so you're comparing her to a horse. That would be something I would do, but I don't think it would be taken the right way. So, you know, in this, we don't use similar imagery. We use probably modern imagery when we, when we flatter someone that we love. But she describes him as swift like a gazelle and strong like a stag, a male deer. She's using flattery to build him up. And that's, that's the important part here. Right? It's so easy to tear others down. It's so easy to get caught up when you're angry to tear someone else down, even somebody you love. Yes, when we build trust, what we do is we build others up. We share with them why we think God made them the way that they are. And we value those relationships. We build them up. And that's what we see here. She's building up her man. How can we build up those whom we love? How do we do that? Well, number one, we have to be intentional about it. All right? When you think something positive, share it. I can't tell you how many times in my life I've looked at my wife and I thought, man, she looks really nice today. Just thought it. And then walked right on by. You know, what an idiot. I, I am a moron. It would have to make her feel good to be told what I'm thinking, what, what's in here, when it's positive. I mean, and, and that's, we have to be intentional about that. It's important to let people we love know that they're loved and they're appreciated and trusted. Don't just tell them what they want to hear. Be honest with the praise. You have to be honest with the praise. Um, so, how do we do this with God? How do we build this kind of trust with God? Um, well, we give him the glory for all things. He deserves it, and he wants to hear us praise him. Yes, he, when I pray for someone, someone who's in the hospital that has been given a dire diagnosis, and doctors come in, and nurses come in, and technicians come in, and then the next thing you know, man, this, this person is on the road to recovery. I mean, everybody's shocked with that. Well, hey, thank you, doctor. Thank you, nurse. Thank you, technician. I appreciate the time and the effort that you put in. We give them praise, no doubt. Yes, God gets that glory. We ask God to act. He acts through people. We're his hands and his feet. Many times, whether we want to be or not, right, we have to give him that glory. But we also have to trust him with our heart. We have to turn everything over to him. Uh, you know, one of the things that made me nervous about Song of Songs is content. You know, it's talking about sex a lot. And I'm thinking, I want to talk about that. It's a, it's a creation of God to be shared between a man and a woman. We are to share even our most intimate details with God. He wants, as he created this for us, right? So we share this with him. And, and you know, he, he made us the way we are for his purpose. So we have to trust him with our heart. He made our heart. It goes to him. Same with our minds. Same with our tongues. goes to him. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, I have no idea how long. I need to start timing this so I know how long I'm taking. So anyway. Songs, uh, Song of Songs 3, verses 1 through 5. Restraint required. In my bed at night, I sought the one I loved. I sought him, but did not find him. I will arise now and go about the city through the streets and the plazas. I will seek the one I love. I sought him, but did not find him. The guards who go about the city found me. I asked them, have you seen the one I love? I just passed them when I found the one I love. I held on to him and would not let him go until I brought him to my mother's house to the chamber of the one who conceived me. Young women of Jerusalem, I charge you by the gazelles and wild 
those of the field do not stir up or awaken love until the appropriate time. So, we believe, and just, just based on what, what I'm reading here, that you know theologians and Bible students, they've looked at this, and we believe this is him writing about a dream sequence, that she's laying in bed and she's dreaming this. All right, so she is searching for her love because she hates being away from it. So they can be together during the day, but at night he goes to his place, she goes to her place, because that's what they're supposed to do. They're not supposed to be together like husband and wife until they are husband and wife. But she hates being away from them. So what does she do? She goes out at night by herself through the city streets. This is very dangerous behavior on her part. Okay, It just is. I, I don't know what Jerusalem was like, but I'm telling you it's got to be dangerous. So how does she find direction here? So obviously she can't find him. She finds directions when guards find her and point her in the right direction. You see, she was protected by the guards and they found her fiance. All right, so just after she talked to them, there's, there's the fiance. But I just, I love the picture here. Oftentimes we try to do so many things on our own. I'm going to fix this. This is a little thing. This isn't something I'm going to bother God with. I can fix this. I'm going to go find this. I'm going to work on the solution. God is constantly, in a sense, chasing us. He wants a relationship with us. He wants us to trust Him. So even sometimes when we're out on our own thinking, I've got this God. God's still there. He's still pursuing us. And He says, I've got you. I'm going to lead you in the right direction. Slow down and let me do that. I really like that. I, I thought that was kind of a jump from kind of what the topic was of this lesson, but I, I really like that picture. So so where did they go? Once she finds him and she, cle and she clings on to him, where did they go? Did they go back to her room? No. They took him to her mother's house because it would not be prudent for them to be gathered, together alone at this time. So they both understand that, you know, we have these desires. So what we don't do is we protect this relationship by not giving in to these desires right now. So what do we do? We go to mom's house because mom is certainly not going to condone this. All right. So, you know, again, they're close together now. So he's he's in a different chamber of this, this room, this house, but, but they're not together. And again, they show great restraint here. And what this is, is not only a respect for one another, it's a respect for God. So what danger does she warn young women of Jerusalem about? It's to giving in to passions that are not godly or sanctioned by God. Yes, this poem could be about any sort of, of desire that we have, whether it be a sexual desire, a desire for money, a desire for fame or power. Uh, it, it could be anything. But what they're doing, what we're looking at right here, is avoiding things that are not sanctioned by God. That's what, how we glorify God, guys. We do what he tells us to do. So what's the danger? So come on. Here we are, 21st century. If it feels good, do it, right? This is this whole archaic idea of getting married. You don't have to get married. What is all of that about? So why don't you just give in to those desires when you want? Why would God give us those feelings? What's the danger in all of that? Guys, I mean, tip of the iceberg. Regret heartache. It's a sin. Unwanted pregnancy. Loss of reputation, his and hers. Um, we go on and on and on and on with all of the, I mean, you give yourself to someone and then all of a sudden there's a breakup, you're not together anymore, and you've already given yourself to someone else. Uh, you've robbed your future husband or your future wife just the kind of regret and guilt that goes along with that. And guys, you know, I, I mean, you think about an unwanted pregnancy. Well, I don't know what they did then, but you know what people do today with unwanted pregnancies? They justify abortions. They say, well, I just can't give this to my child. So they, they justify those. Types. And then it just leads to one sin after another sin after another sin. And it's, it's self-hate. Guys, that's not what God wants. God doesn't want us hating ourselves. God created us in love he loves us. He wants us to live in a way that glorifies Him. 
And really, guys, it protects us from that kind of hatred and that kind of hurt. All right. So I just kind of want to finish up with this. So how does following her advice in this poem, how does that please God? And as we said when we started this lesson, our purpose is to glorify him. Now, we can do that with our words, but our actions oftentimes speak louder than words. And I harp on this time and time again about being doers of the word, not just hearers of the word. God has given us his holy word. He spelled out how we are to glorify him. We need to not only know how to do that, we need to do it. It needs to be done physically. So how? How do we glorify God? How do we do these things? Well, the most important thing is we accept his son whom he sacrificed for us. All right. So I, I don't want any of our lessons, and I think I may be messed up last week, but I don't want any of our lessons to go by without talking about the gospel message. I don't know who's watching this. I don't know who you send this to. I don't know who has, I think anybody has access to this. And I want you to know that God loves you so much that he gave his one and only son to take your sin and my sin, no matter what you've ever done. Jesus took that to the cross and he died with our sins so that we could be forgiven. And then he rose on the third day And he's coming back. Because we can trust in that. And we can glorify God by accepting his son as our Lord and Savior. We have to seek to follow him in all that we do. Yes, that's how we express our love to God. We're intentional. We spend time with him. We honor him. He wants us in a close relationship, guys. But it requires effort on our part. I've already said he pursues us. He's ready at any time. All we got to do sometimes is slow down and just spend time with them. Yes, thank you for spending time with me today. Uh, I hope this has been something that's been good for you. I hope that uh, maybe anything that, that is in this has spoken to you a little bit. And if nothing else, maybe you just take a little time and just spend some time with God in prayer. And uh, God desires that. God wants that. And uh, that's what we have to do. Guys, thank you for watching, and I will see you again next week. Love you guys. See you.